So I'd like to say hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the first discussion event of the Constitution of Everyday Life series. This is a project sponsored by the Center for International and Comparative Law here at Emory University School of Law. Um, and I've been provided with a wonderful description of what the uh, Constitution of Everyday Life project is going to be all about as we move forward. Uh, in this multi-year project, and I mean, are we going with cycle? Is the pronunciation of the acronym cycle or CICL, Constitution of Everyday, or sorry, Center for International Comparative Law, will explore how fundamental societal institutions such as the family, workplace, and healthcare systems have been shaped in various legal cultures in the shadow of distinct foundational political principles. We are particularly interested in how conceptions of individual autonomy, liberty, and agency function to either restrain or legitimate governmental in interventions and exercises of power, as well as how and when such interventions can be justified in the interest of societal or collective well-being in each legal culture. And it's a wonderful description, I think, to connect to our discussion um, today. Um, over the past few months, and here's Ashley Hopner Wong right here. <laughs> this is the first time to see her. It's a next. I'm very grateful to um, Ashley as well as to Mangala Kanathan for their support um, helping to organize the event. Uh, and I particularly, of course, also want to acknowledge and thank Professor Mar Martha Albertson Feynman right here. She is Robert Woodruff Professor of Law and um, Director of the Center for International and Comparative Law. And a few other things, but those are the key points for today. So thank you so much, Martha, for um, everything you've done to help make this event possible. Um, now I'd like to introduce our featured speaker and our panel. So um, our featured speaker is Sarah Lambden. Uh, Professor Lambden is Professor of Law at the CUNY School of Law in New York. She has her law degree from KU, um, as well as her master's degree in library science and legal information management. Um, she actually started her career with expertise in environmental law and law librarianship and focusing on environment, environmental issues. Um, she wrote the book in 2017, Environmental Information, Research, Access, and environmental decision making. And I see the thread of from that specific project to the broader points that we're making today, um, because it was right about that time that she started working on her next project, uh, which is data cartels, the focus of our uh, of our event today. Um, yes, fresh, fresh off the presses. Um, and data cartels is really a good company with a bunch of other books and articles and scholarly conversations, policy conversations, economic conversations, educational, higher ed, people are nodding in the room because we're all talking about um, where we stand today with the information and data economy and what it means for our institutions, for us as, as people, um, and so on. So in data cartels, Professor Lambden studies data analytics companies and she calls for treating our critical information resources like a public good and for creating a digital infrastructure that reflects our information ideals. So welcome. Um, our panelist guest is from the Georgia Institute of Technology, also what we say here, Georgia Tech. Um, and that this is Professor Rosa Ariaga. She is Associate Professor of, of Interactive Computing at the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. She is a human computer interaction researcher which I have just recently learned, HCI is a whole, that's like IRAC for legal writing, they have HCI. And um, I'll tell you about IRAC over dinner, you'll, you'll, you'll want to go home, uh, but at any rate, um, so human computer interaction researcher. And Professor Ariaga uses concepts, theories, and methods from psychology to address fundamental topics of human computer interaction and social computing. Um, she has a healthcare connection, which I think is another important layer to the conversation that we're going to have today. Her current research interests are in the area of chronic care management and mental health. So I'm going to briefly introduce myself as the third person on the panel, because I want to take a moment to um, talk about my connection to these topics um, as well. I teach legal research and writing. 
kind of an old timer. I've been around here since 2001. And teaching 1Ls, you know, and, and working with Lexus and Westlaw and all that as sort of an experience of what legal information is has just been something I've been thinking about for a really, um, really long time. Uh, they're wonderful products. Uh, they are incredible, but I also think it's so important for all of us to approach them with a critical eye, and I think that's um, what Professor Lambda's book really does. Um, I wrote a book for legal master students who are um, like compliance, police officers, H, um, HR people, administration, people who are not JDs, but they are going to use law and interact a lot with lawyers. And so um, that book is Legal Literacy, Working with Law and Lawyers. And it is a textbook, but in its own way, it um, connects with some of the themes of the book regarding um, the paywalls around information and what we're what is possible to do if you're not one of the sort of insiders with access to these wonderful, expensive products. Um, I also am the co-author or co-editor of the Indigo book, which is an open source alternative to the Blue Book. So in its own way, that is another um, way to, I, I'm trying to provide open access to legal information through my work with the Indigo book. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Lambden for a, a brief talk on her, on her, her book, and then we'll have some discussion. All right. So yeah, I wanted to start before, because we I want to focus mostly on the conversation that we're going to have, but I figured I should start by giving you kind of some background on the book itself and kind of the, the topic. Yeah, there we go. That's fine. Now it looks like it looks when I lecture in my own class. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to explain a little bit about what I mean when I talk about data cartels, and then I'm going to talk about how I learned about this topic because it's that's an interesting thing in itself. And finally, I'm going to talk about how these companies impact our lives and the way, the things I'm going to discuss are especially salient for people who do legal research or academic research. So usually when I talk at a, an institution like this, it, it like there there are a lot of points that people can pick up on that are relevant to their own lives. So I'm going to start by talking about data cartels um, and just giving a little overview. Hmm. You know what? This is also wait. Oh, you know what? It's me. There we go. So this book came out just a few months ago in November, 2022. I started writing it in 2017 for reasons that I'll describe in a few minutes. But the gist of the book, the summary is that a few companies have come to dominate our information markets. So the main company that I use as an example throughout my book is a company called Reed Elsevier Lexis Nexus or Relics Group. So you can hear a lot of names in there that sound familiar. There's Lexus, there's Nexus, there's Elsevier. And Reed was actually an old um, news and financial information uh, enterprise. And they are all now one institution, one um, company. And in my book, the reason this image is here is because in my book, I compare them to octopus-like monopolies. So when I first drafted a rough draft, I workshopped it at... Um, at a center that I, I work with at NYU. And um, uh, now I can't remember her name. Professor Dreyfus, who's a famous intellectual property professor, was there, Rochelle Dreyfus. And she said, This reminds me that what you're describing right now reminds me of a monopoly um, that em embraces like a lot of different areas. Because, you know, sometimes monopolies will dominate one market, and then you talk about like, vertical monopolies, horizontal um, monopolies, but there are also these types of monopolies, especially like standard oil is just the classic example that are large and harmful to consumers because they have so many, so big that they put their tentacles into all sorts of different industries and markets. And then if you look at the image, they also are very enwrapped in the government, right? Um, governments depend on them. Uh, there's a lot of agency capture, right? A lot of kind of revolving door behavior where people work, go from the products or, or the, the business side to the company side. And that is definitely what happens with companies like Reed Elsevier, Lexus, Nexus. However, I did not know any of this when I started my research. Um, so yeah, I rearranged my slides and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? But I'll tell you, I'll first tell you. So 
a few companies dominate our information markets. And I think that that's a problem because um, we have this weird interlink now between our publishing companies. So companies like Elsevier companies, and this is true for all businesses, um, not just, or for all publishing businesses, not just academic ones or legal ones, but all of our industries are also kind of turning towards data analytics. And from an informational standpoint, that's doubly dangerous in this case because these companies have so much information and they are also major personal data brokers. They have a ton of our personal data as I'll describe in a few minutes. And um, they make products. So they, they sell us legal information platforms like Lexis or Westlar. They sell us you know, Elsevier or Science Direct journals, but they also make products like these, right? They make analytics products. So they make things like academic metrics and impactors. So if you've ever been part of a um, academic cadre or academic subject area, I know it's not as common in the law. Like usually we just look at our SSRN hits, but SSRN is also a relics product. So that's something to think about. But um, our most academic metrics come from Elsevier, Scopus, Pure, Cyval. Those are all Elsevier products. Um, things like COVID-19 projections, those are also data analytics. So predictions about where pandemics might hit, where illnesses are going, stock market predictions, predictions about how markets and industries will fare in the future, and also predictive policing products. So um, uh, uh, products that use data to assess how risky we are, our risk of committing a crime or committing fraud, right? These are all example, examples of data analytics products. And these are all types of products that these companies like Relics are, are getting into. Um, and so what I started wondering was how this kind of octopus-like monopoly over all these information types impacts our privacy, our personal privacy, and also information access. So I consider myself to be like an information law scholar because my background is in librarianship. So when I, I, I teach FOIA classes and open government classes and administrative law classes um, that talk about how we can get access to government information and, and you know participate in administrative processes through notice and comment and other informational requirements. But then on the other end, I talk about how some data and information, especially our personal information, should be private, right? And that's kind of the informational spectrum I think of. And these companies hit both of those things, right? They, they make critical information paywalled and private, and they make our personal data go places that we wouldn't want it to go. Um, so before I describe how this works a little, I want to describe what a data analytics company even means. And I want to do that by giving you a little background about how I found out about this problem. So in 2017, I was working in a law library, CUNY School of Law's law, that law library. I had also, I had helped build, before that I helped build Bloomberg Law, which is like a legal information platform. And before that I worked at a bunch of law firms. Um, I was like a research analyst. I was, I was kind of like their I was like a blend between a legal researcher and also like a private eye because I had access, honestly, to LexisNexis products that I could use to get a lot of information about people. Um, so data analytics is the pursuit of extracting meaning from raw data using specialized computer systems. These systems transform, organize, and model the data to draw conclusions and identity path and identify patterns. So in 2017, I didn't know this. I didn't, I'd never heard of data analytics or thought critically about it at all. I was really an environmental law um, researcher and professor and teacher. Like I, I, I didn't know anything about this, but I was sitting at my desk in my law library in 2017 and this article was sent to me. Somebody notified me of this article. The title of the article is, these are the technology firms lining up to build Trump's extreme vetting program. And I was, I, somebody said, you're going to want to read this. It's about LexisNexis. And I was like, what do you mean it's about LexisNexis? And it turns out that this article, these, these two um, journalists who now have gotten the opportunity to meet, and they are very interested in this type of, um, this type of activity, and they research a lot about data brokers and write about them. But in 2017, they were concerned with the with how ICE was going to build an invasive um, 
data surveillance program, right? Kind of like what the NSA did after 9-11. And, and Trump, um, President Trump at the time, um, you know, told, directed ICE and DHS to start building something called an extreme vetting surveillance program. So in order to begin that work, um, ICE held an investor day and they invited a bunch of data brokers to try to explain what they wanted so that these data brokers could build them products to use, data products to use. And I noticed that Thomson Reuters Special Services um, and LexisNexis Special Services, that's TRSS and LNSS, both had representatives at this meeting. And I was like, what could Lexus and, cause Thomson Reuters is Lexus's parent company. So my initial thought was, well, what are Lexus and Westlaw selling to help build a surveillance program? Do they need like court cases to do that? What, what is going, like how, how are Westlaw and Lexus working with ICE? And I, I mean, I assumed that like the council, you know, DHS lawyers and, and, and all the agency council, they have access to Westlaw and Lexus, but like, what are, what are they doing here in this context? Um, and I became very curious. Um, so I, me and a colleague wrote a blog post for the American Association of Law Libraries. What we did didn't feel controversial at all. We were just librarians going to our professional organization saying, hey, we saw this article and we noticed LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters are doing this. Are we worried about like client confidentiality or conflict of interest? Like, what is going on? And does it? And honestly, like, does anybody know what is going on? Can we talk about this? So, we posted the the post on the AAL website, and within two minutes, the post was removed from the AAL website, um, and it was clear that we would not be allowed to talk about this at the American Association of Law Libraries. And we were told flat out. You can talk about this wherever you want, but you can't talk about it here. Unfortunately, the American Association of Law Libraries is where we have all of our conversations at the law librarian community. So this, frankly, pissed me off. <laughs> and I and it also made me wonder, like, what is A, what is going on? And B, are these companies so powerful that they've cowed a gigantic organization into just into censoring librarians, right? Um, so that made me curious. And I began researching, um, <laughs> researching what I'd always thought to be legal publishers, and I found out a lot about how they actually work. So, sorry, I, I regret, I regret trying to reorder my slides. I don't, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like the flow here. But what I found was that um, our publishers no longer consider themselves publishers. So Elsevier doesn't call itself a publisher anymore. Westlaw is no longer a legal information publisher. Um, LexisNexis, definitely not a publisher. Instead, they consider themselves data analytics companies and data solutions companies. In fact, um, Morgan Stanley recategorized uh, Westlaw or Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis uh, relics, all of relics, from media company to um, I think business services, business solutions which are two totally different things. A media company produces content. Business Solutions does, as I now know, data analytics. So they, and there, there are a lot of really good reasons for publishers to be making this transition, right? Paper publishing is pretty much going out the window. Like it, nobody's buying multiple sets of statutes or case books anymore. Nobody's buying paper Elsevier journals anymore, right? So their business model is suffering. They're publicly traded companies who have to continue to be profitable. Um, and they found a new way to make money, right? In the digital era. So they they went with it. I mean, if, if, honestly, if I was working inside of their company, this business model would make perfect sense, right? And they're following in a, in a common trend. All industries are moving towards data analytics. Like we know that because everything is feeling a little creepier than it used to, right? Um, our thermometers are digitally connected to, to track us. Our refrigerator takes our data. Our, our, our cars, they definitely report our, our data to insurance providers, right? And even like, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not a lead. I, I also use these products. Um, I. Uh, and wearing a watch right now that is tracking every single thing I'm doing down to like my heart beating, right? So they're just following the trend of getting into data and they're really, really well positioned to do so. So these companies are unique in that they have such a wealth of information and data already at their fingertips. 
They have tons of raw data. They have the entire corpus of US law. Elsevier has more academic data about both academics and research than any other company, bar none. Um, and they have tons of financial data. They buy companies like Securities Mosaic and all of these small companies that scrape SEC filings, you know, do, do things kind of like what a Bloomberg terminal does, right? So now they have all of this financial data. They, Reuters is its own news service. Nexus is the biggest um, news archive in the world. They have tons of news information. And this is, this is the fact that they don't make public. They are all the, the government's biggest data brokers. They are gigantic personal data brokers. They receive personal data about all of us from over 10,000 sources. We all have a Lex ID, which is a universal identifier, like a social security number, but it lives inside Lexis. They get data from over 10,000 sources updated in real time about all of us. Um, so they are huge data brokers. They have billions of dollars worth of contracts with government agencies, including now. <laughs> ICE, um, law enforcement, over, over a thousand law enforcement agencies, um, and also Child Protective Services, Social Security Administrations, and other benefits um, giving, you know, agencies, um, and also major institutions that make decisions about our lives, like insurance companies, uh, banks, healthcare systems. That's one that they're getting into pretty heavy right now, which I think is going to be kind of central to our discussion. So what they do is they can sell raw information and raw data, right? They can sell a journal article or a court case or our, a, your personal data dossier, right? So they can sell that. They also sell platforms like Westlaw, Lexis, Science Direct, Scopus, where they take data and information and they organize it into databases so that we can search it ourselves, right? Work, workflow solutions, things that make our lives easier. Um, by allowing us to log into some walled garden platform and do our research. There might be little bells and whistles like citators, head notes, that kind of thing. But where they're really making their money is in the top of the pyramid because this is, this is valuable. This is the crystal ball, right? What they do is they can take all of this stuff, all of this, these informational troves, and run them through predictive and prescriptive data analytics systems. So algorithms, whatever you want. I mean, artificial intelligence, you know, whatever types of systems can kind of crunch through data and break down information to guess and rank, guess at how risky we might be, rank things by how popular they might be in the future and make predictions and prescriptions that they can sell to ICE, law enforcement agencies, insurance companies about, you know, fraud risk, our, our employers about how we might behave, how well we might fare as an employee, um, and other big decision makers, right, who want to know more about us before they know whether to give us a loan, give us a job, give us housing, that kind of thing. So this is, this, I didn't even make this up. This is from a company called Clarivate, which is a big uh, academic and library systems company that also makes academic metrics. This is from their 10K, I think it was their 2021 annual report. And um, I, I mean, I just added some stuff to it, but this is this is their own business model. That, that they would they would admit this. I'm not like pulling a mask. You know, it's not like Scooby Doo where I pull the bad guy on top. This is just what they do now. Um, and so they they sell pres prescriptions and predictions. They also have consolidated. Right, we all know that information industries, publishers, music industries, they've all there's a lot of consolidation going on. You know, news industries and our informational products aren't immune to that, right? We all know there's a legal information duopoly. There's two major legal information companies, Westlaw and Lexis. Um, academic information, there's a little oligopoly that includes Elsevier. Uh, Clarivate, which is a major academic metrics um, system, used to belong to Thomson Reuters. Relics tends to hold on to its companies and keep just keep a very huge corporate umbrella. Thomson Reuters likes to like spin off its company. It's interesting. They make companies and they're like, okay, Clarivate, we're going to sell, you know, we're going to sell you for billions of dollars and do something different. Like they had a huge financial product that rivaled Bloomberg's. And I think in 2019, they sold it to the London Stock Exchange. They're like, there it is. But like Relics doesn't do that as much. They tend to, they like to keep it, they like to keep it big there. They're a big company. Um, they have tons of news information, right? Reuters is now one of the last gigantic news outlets standing um, as far as, uh, 
paper, like not paper, written news. Not, I'm not like going to compare them to, you know, CNN, Fox, MSNBC. But um, as far as like written journalism, financial information, and then there are the government's biggest data brokers. It's really hard to see that in research because. They actually include non-disclosure agreements in a lot of their government contracts, and for some reason, the government actually follows. Like, I think I would, I want to write uh, more formally about how that violates the Freedom of Information Act, but <laughs> I don't know. For the, I guess maybe of what confidential business information or national security exception. I don't know how they manage that, but we don't see it. But they are the government's biggest data brokers, um, and they never get mentioned. So. They also have benefited from this consolidation and this consolidation feeds this system, right? With all, with, if they own the most of this information, then they're able to make the most robust predictions and prescri prescriptions, right? So this all works together. Um, this is just one example. These are all Reed Elsevier Lexis Nexus companies, all of them. This isn't even, this is not, I couldn't even, I tried to do this when I was writing my book, make a list of all of them. There are too many. Um, but here are just a few, you probably recognize some of them. These are all part of the same company and they're all considered data analytics products and companies. So how does this impact us? That's really what we're going to talk about. We have less privacy because these gigantic data brokers are kind of in, in all of our research products now and a lot of products that we use in our daily lives. We have less academic and intellectual freedom. We don't know how we're being tracked on these on these platforms now, and we do know that our data is very valuable to these companies. We have less control over our research assessment over, you know, the choices in our academic lives because they're being made by these academic metrics. And we also have less access to information and less choice about where we get information from. Like a lot of times when I talk about how these companies are working with ICE or law enforcement or child protective services, people are all like, ooh, I don't, I don't feel, I don't love that for my clients and me. But you can't not use Westlaw and Lexus, right? That's that's the problem of monopolies, like lack of consumer choice. We can't not use them. That's that. Those are our choices. Um, so, yeah, I, I talk a lot about algorithmic bias um, and also data biases. Um, we can talk about that. But so I will just say this is how their products are advertised, right? They're advertised like this beautiful, miraculous solution. This is how I describe them in my book because this is really what they're like. The algorithms are, are not perfect. We, there, there's a whole body of scholarship on algorithmic bias written by people like Ruha Benjamin, Sophia Moja Noble, um, uh, uh, Kathy O'Neill. Um, I can't remember her name, Eubanks, Virginia Eubanks. There's, there's a whole body of, because I'm, I'm also not a technologist, I'm a librarian. So I don't talk much about algorithms. But there, there's a lot out there indicating the algorithms are very biased. But I do know for a fact that the data quality in the, these products, in Relix's products and Thompson Reuters products, are full of flaws. In fact, there's this article, okay, let me find it, it's way here, it's at the end, but it's, it, it's my last slide. This, there's a whole article called when Lexus Nexus Makes a Mistake, You Pay For It, and it's all about how erroneous data um, has locked people out of their own bank accounts, has made it impossible for them to get car insurance. Here's one about um, how people's insurance rates are being raised based on this data um, erroneously. Landlords are, um, are preventing people from getting housing based on faulty um, information about people's housing histories or visits to housing courts. Um, there, there are so many examples. I could do a whole talk about just those examples. But what I like about this fun factory um, uh, comparison is this is actually how Relics describes its own business model. And it looks just like one of those Plato uh -huh. like they did it themselves. They illustrated it. So on this end, you have like the Plato and it's just like all primary research, public records, news articles, contributory databases, unstructured records, structured records. Basically, it's all of this stuff that I just described over here, all of it, right? That's on the, the entry side. And then it goes through some sort of like magic process in the middle where increased quant content quality and decreased content volume happen. Like that's the algorithm. That's whatever is doing the <laughs> algorithmic magic. And then on the other end, they, they come out with these very vague, fancy products called entity resolution, link analysis, clustering analysis, and complex analysis. 
I always say they don't describe what they do very specifically because it would be bad PR because it's all pretty creepy. Um, so I, this, this is what this, this that part on the other end, um, it is this stuff. They link us all together based on our data dossiers. They can map us where we are and what, where we might go next. They can identify you even if they only have like your last name and it's misspelled and part of your social security number. Thomson Reuters actually calls it making the invisible visible. So if you are trying to stay under the radar, they can find you. And I, that can be very helpful in some situations, right? Like I could imagine a situation where we would want to find someone who is hiding out, but there are other situations where that might not be ideal. Like um, law enforcement agents have used, uh, have misused LexisNexis products like stock ex-girlfriends, things like that. Yeah, so there are also great uses of this stuff. They can um, notify your insurance company when anything happens to you at all that might affect your um, your risk levels. They, they share data, they, they group like all sorts of different entities together, kind of creating these like third-party fusion center type of things that are totally unregulated, that are because they're private and they're not part of any government agency, just doing whatever they do. Um, and they can also make, they can make like hot lists that li list us by how risky we are or whether they should surveil us or not, whoever, you know, whoever wants to know more about us. And this is our, this is that Lex ID I was talking about. So um, it's like a social security number. It's a universal identifier. Uh, and I know that when we started using social security numbers, one major concern was that these social security numbers would become kind of these gigantic government dossiers that they would pour all of our data into. So they made sure to make social security numbers very like mission specific and very narrow in scope. And we all learned that they're very private and you know, they're, they're, they're just for your state identification. However, these LEX IDs have no boundaries on them. There are 283 million of them in the US alone. So they contain over 78 million records growing all the time, updated in real time from over 10,000 sources of data. It is impossible to know what those 10,000 sources are. That was one of my quests that I still want to know. But, you know, when you're doing legal research, you can look and see a list of all the databases that, that they have that on, on their platforms. You cannot see that. But both Thomson Reuters and Reed Elsevier LexisNexis use that 10,000 plus number. They can, yeah, so they can do all sorts of stuff. It is creepy. And um, yeah, they, law enforcement uses it. Uh, over 70% of local governments and almost government agencies and 80% of federal agencies use LexisNexis. Um, like, like I said already, like these are the other entities that use it. And I think that's kind of the overview. It's tough to talk about because it covers both issues of access and issues of privacy, which are different, but they all come together here. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I think we should. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So um, I'm Rosa Arriaga and I'm in interactive computing and in interactive computing, we think about um, how to study and understand the impact that computing artifacts uh, computing mediated interactions have on humans. And so it really is the other side of all of these things you're talking about. And as I was thinking about it, um, you know, what are, what's the answer? Like, what are the solutions? And I think that uh, we definitely have seen, you know, business models that have come out of that. And so, you know, kind of the, the one that you probably all know about is, um, you know, DuckDuckGo, where you can have these private, uh, infrastructures or that will allow you to surf the web and not not be caught um, uh, or other uh, entities that allow you to go uh, go online or or chat or whatever. But um, on the academic side, and so kind of to introduce you know what we do in human centered computing and human computer interaction. So you know at a very basic level, HCI is a study of how to build systems that are useful and usable. And when we think about it from a human-centered computing point, we really think about what are, what are those uh, socio-technical historical lenses that get us to this point of building these systems. And as I was thinking about what you were doing and how this all uh, comes together, um, just to give you an example of you know, how I study this, and I'll tell you that my, 
my area really is in, in health and wellness, but um, I have a student who's looking to design um, what he called subversive uh, information tools. So how is it that we can now build a system that will be a barrier between at least some aspects of our data? Because I think one of the things that came out uh, in, in uh, your book is that not everybody is equally negatively impacted and marginalized communities, you know, get it worse. They get kind of both sides of it. And so that there really, there really is a need or, um, and I think, you know, you mentioned some of the books that are out there, some of the things that computer scientists and human-centered computer scientists are trying to do is really to think about, first of all, to bring this to the light, to think about futures where we can start to imagine how we could have um, uh, some control of, of our data, and then to, uh, to really understand what are new models of actually being able to build this. And when um, when I was done, uh, you know, reading your book, I'm like, oh, great, you know, one, one more thing. But really, what we talk a lot about in, you know, in human-centered computing is this idea that your algorithms are only as good as your data. And so there, what you have is you have these people that do have all your data right, on the one hand, but on the other hand, that some of the data that's most critical is incredibly biased. And so what I think a lot about is the um, information bias in the health system and how it is that, that you know, when we think about what the future of, of health care is and we think about kind of individualized care, but in fact, it isn't individualized. It actually is very, um, very siloed, and it represents only the people that live within a certain number of miles from uh, uh, academic uh, medical centers. And so all those biases that come into play, but I think the other, the other thing that we do in human-centered computing is really try to take the veil off of this kind of utopian view that everything's going to be great and we have this data. And so I think that it is really important to be in a room where you have both the designers, and I, you know, I say that with a lowercase d for myself, but really people like you that think about what are these implications and how can we start to think about solutions that um, can at least hope, help the public uh, get a, have an understanding of what's going on. Um, so to piggyback on that last point, um, I think that the HCI designers and the people in the room who, who build these things, um, you know, I've talked to people who are not in law at all about, oh, we need, you know, we need, we need ethics classes, we need societal classes, we need the liberal arts so that the technical is not separated from the human. Um, and I, I, I think that that is, um, and I'm sure that's, Pretty much not that surprising of an insight to your entire field, um, but it is newly fresh as we think about, you know, who's in the room building things and then like uh, what happens after that. So I was I was talking last week to uh, someone I hadn't seen for a long time about this event and um, describing, you know, what, what your book is about and what we were going to talk about. And she said isn't it kind of just too late? Like the cat's out of the bag, you know? Isn't it, isn't it really just too late to really do anything about this? And um, I wanted to, I have a, like 10 or 12 different areas I would love to focus on, but I think that's what I want to focus on in my, in my time. Um, I was very interested, you know, in some of, your, um, some of your ideas at the end, like the idea of an information fiduciary, I think is a really, um, it's a broad concept, you know, for lawyers and for anyone in a, in a trust profession, the, the concept of a fiduciary is such a robust and moral, um, and moral role. So um, that was a really attractive framing, I think, for me. And it also reminded me of some, you know, so like, and I think you say this in your book, so many con contractual provisions, the license provision and lawsuits 
where the, the information, they've kind of disclaimed all accuracy, you know? So we're, we're, we're putting information that's, I think, good. You know, we have good scholarship, we have good um, health, you know, health and science research, um, and then you have all the unstructured data and the additional, you know, things that you, that you mentioned. We have good, good data, and then what are the promises or what is the accountability on the other side that it will be useful? And so part of that is accuracy. Part of it is fairness and equity, and like a, you mentioned, the datification of injustice. So the effects of what goes in and then what 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 comes out. Um, I would say that this is yet another of many historical examples where um, the market may want to buy injustice. <laughs> um, you know, the, a product that 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 makes a risk assessment that may um, comport with certain prejudices or, you know, or certain preconceived notion is going to be more attractive, perhaps, to some market players, and that is not a healthy dynamic for our society. Um, and so that's one of a number of think, structures calling for regulation. That's what I said to, to my friend who said, well, we, we can't regulate the cats out of the bag. Well, we, we have to be you can't be helpless. I mean, everything can be regulated, right? Like, I mean, it's difficult, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean the law shouldn't shouldn't try. Um, and so, I was thinking uh, also um, about sort of where's the where's the pragmatic, actionable legal uh, responses to that. So, one response is you know. And DuckDuckGo, I think, is, is great, but is a little bit um, in the, the sort of neoliberal theory of, like, each person can just figure out for themselves what to use and what to do. Like, if you don't like, you know, Westlaw and Lexus, don't use it. Use Google Scholar or use, you know, use, use FastCase, use something else. Um, so just the individual person's decision to avoid a system is not really, a, is not a solution um, at all. Um, there's the story which uh, Professor Lambden and I were talking about, which is, I think it's Ross Intel. Ross tried to start, tried to get into the legal research market and start, um, start up its own research system. What it seems to have done is utilized public data that was in Westlaw, all right? So it was cases which can't be copyrighted, but they're in Westlaw with page numbers and other, other things like that. So Ross went to, to, to Westlaw system to get, they didn't get like copyrighted treatises that they're paying authors for, but just data that would have been public anyway, threw that out. Westlaw sued them for copyright. What the, and I mean, there's, this is a very simplistic sort of high level description of it, but the lawsuit from Thomson Reuters, which is quite well funded, put Ross out of business. So Ross is, Ross is no more. But their lawsuit lives on, and last year they were, I think they got past a summary judgment or dismissed or something on one of their antitrust claims. So that's an example of, you know, a defunct company that is still, you know, pursuing through litigation some of the antitrust ideas that are broadly stated in your book. I think that it's it's kind of like a David and Goliath. It's heroic and neat, and let's see what happens. Like, this is, this is going to be interesting to watch, but I guess I don't necessarily see that as a market solution or a broad, like litigating our way towards your um, policies is probably not going to um, be effective. On the other end of the spectrum is the, um, the FTC action to ban all non-competes everywhere. Like, we're just not going to have non-competes anymore. And, um, you know, the, this is... Uh, in, in the conversations I'm in, that is viewed as like, that's probably not going to be constitutional or that's, not deep, or that's too broad. And so just top down, like saying, we're, this is bad, we're not going to do this anymore, it has too many problems, um, is also too far to the, to, the, to the other side. So in the middle, you know, we're left with, and I think you kind of talk about this, like small incursions to maybe like separate companies, not and, and so to separate them or to create these new theories um, that can fit within existing legal um, frameworks for accountability and so on. And uh, that is uh, that is certainly attractive. I want to say one more thing, and I'm seeing my colleague here who just gave a wonderful presentation about chat GPT and what it means for um, for law, we can't have anything that has the word technology in it in this uh, in this month without mentioning chat GPT just a tiny bit. Um, and this whole AI quote revolution um, 
has actually made me respect, like, and be more um, just has increased my affinity for a company like Westlaw or Lexus because I think that, you know, they're, they may be a, a loosely defined cartel, they may be a monopoly, but their information may not be perfect, but it is reliable as it is reliable to a standard. I feel like they're not going to give the information to another, you know, competitor or client. They're, like, confidentiality is hopefully in the contract, but certainly in, like, a very well-established practice. And so it is a time to, I think, um, reflect on the value that legacy information providers and that established legal services providers uh, what they what they deliver over. Oh, we're going to innovate. We're going to have competition. Well, sometimes competition uh, is the the people who are competing don't understand the actual underlying values of the profession that they are trying to destabilize and innovate in. So that is a little bit a tiny bit of counter um, counter analysis of of the companies. But I certainly think that people should know more about um, how their data is. Fun factoring into from everything into um, uh, into these products. So uh, those those are my comments from a legal standpoint. And I guess um, in keeping with the uh, constitution of everyday life and much of what I've learned and I hope picked up by osmosis from uh, sitting with Professor Martha Albertson Feynman at the Vulnerability and Human Condition um, Initiative through the years. Um, I want to end on this question about um, is information different because it's intimate and human and we can't help but make it just as we can't help but breathe, you know, like our heartbeat might be saying, you know, I'm healthy or I'm not healthy or I'm nervous or I'm not nervous Our, you know, for women, our menstrual cycle may be saying something about our, our legal status, our familial status and so on. And so, you know, is there's very personal information. There's legal information about our relationships into our to our government, to one another, to our employers, to our institutions. All of these, which they do, maybe don't determine, but they greatly influence our well-being and our ability to to prosper or not. And so, is information different from guns? or from food, or from, you know, electricity, or from any other thing that is regulated to some degree or not, this information, do we feel like it's humanity or it's, it's potential to um, convey our humanity and to be broken apart and sold and, and, and sell our humanity? Does that um, call for a different um, approach? So, thank you. Yes, yes.